below. So this video is a little bit of a recap on something I presented for the students at Occidental for the summer research program as far as how to prepare them for a good poster presentation. That's not as simple as just slapping a bunch of things onto a piece of poster board that there's a lot of nuance to it, especially if you want to make good first impressions with people that may be future employers, or even if you're just trying to convey data to a audience that is relatively widespread uh, in their disciplines. And also how you can retool that for an audience that is much more specialized, much more at a professional level and so on. So again, this pitch is more for undergraduates for poster presentations, which I think is a really valuable skill for undergraduates to have. Not every undergrad has the ability to do this. Well, I should say not the ability, but the um, opportunity to do this. So being able to do this, especially outside of a regular class setting, I think is really helpful because it gets your mind working in the gears of how you want to actually discuss things with an audience and how you craft your message beforehand for the audience that you have in mind. Excuse me, just taking a swig blatantly during a video. Okay, I gotta stay hydrated. Um, all right, so <clears throat> without further ado, Let's take a look, shall we? So in this demo, I will showcase a few things. I will probably skip over the demonstration of some of the tools because this is being posted on my YouTube channel and those videos giving a very comprehensive demonstration of those tools are elsewhere on this channel. So unlike the, the live version of this presentation, I'll be skipping over those because you could just jump in on those anytime. But for now, let's take a look into how we go about creating and delivering an effective poster presentation. So some ideas to talk about. First, we'll go over why we even bother presenting posters. Some people might see this as an outdated information conveyance format, but I argue otherwise. I've already mentioned a big deal about considering your audience. Some of the tools I'll kind of just briefly showcase and so on and so forth. And in particular, talk about how you create a poster beyond just using the tools, but also the formatting and the do's and don'ts of formatting. But again, the poster is only part of the situation. You have to present the poster. The poster does not present alone. So I have tips as well for presenting in person, but also potentially for a video format to a small audience. There are some miscellaneous ideas that I wanted to toss in as well, because you may encounter some specific situations as you are preparing for your poster or delivering your poster or other things might happen. And then I'll wrap up with some conclusions. All right, so who am I to be speaking about this? Chances are, if you've kind of seen me in other videos, you have an idea of what my ideas and interests are. So what makes me qualified more so to talk about this? Well, a little bit of a background. You can call me Professor Erstad. Uh, my name is Kevin Erstad. I had gotten my graduate degree over in UC Riverside, did a postdoc in University of Michigan with uh, Dr. Ken Barrage. And I, um, yeah, so sometimes I'm a little bit of an oddball as per this poster. But as for what I do right now, I work in the cognitive science department of Occidental College, and generally my research is within the field of neuroscience, specifically dealing with uh, histology, so the brain tissues, how circuits in the brain connect, and how we can manipulate those specific circuits to bring about or stop specific behaviors. Now, my qualifications for this topic in particular include the fact that I've presented posters at eight national 
and or international conferences. So here's one in particular that I had presented before I had moved on to my postdoc talking about uh, double injection track tracing where I was trying to see where things met in the middle, so to speak. In other words, where maybe the, the lateral hypothalamus and the nucleus accumbens talk to each other via the ventral pallidum, which, you know, there has been a decent amount of research about, but nothing that conclusively showed the same neurons connected through a chain of those areas. So this is me at the SFN conference. This is a Society for Neuroscience annual conference. Uh, happens once a year. National conference, but we get some international people coming by. And you can have people at all levels of their field presenting. And basically anything that falls under the territory of neuroscience can be presented at this conference. Now to give a little bit more of a background, uh, you'll see uh, some semblance of how large this conference is. But as an undergraduate, you may be dealing with much smaller conferences. So I have a little bit of a compare contrast in this presentation talking about those specific differences. As far as my credentials in trying to teach other people and coach them in doing this, I've had four undergraduates that I've helped with their poster presentations. That number actually might be a bit higher now, but suffice to say, I think that they all did a pretty good job with their poster presentations. Um, two of them were thesis students that worked under me previously. All right, so enough about me though. Why do we care about posters? Like I said, some people see this as an archaic information conveyance format. And so this is sometimes true because if we could do things with video, if we can do things with live demonstrations, that's certainly better. And we have a lot of technology that allows for that. Not to mention also uh, when it comes to ink and paper, there are uh, physical world costs as well as environmental concerns with having to do all that stuff. Certainly poster paper is not exactly the most environmentally conscious stuff treated with all sorts of chemicals to allow for better glossy texture and all that nonsense. And even if you could argue, sure, we could print it on cloth, the dyes themselves are not inexpensive. So people would ask, why don't we just switch it all to a more video presentation format? Well, this isn't always feasible. Keep in mind that when it comes to video formats, this is kind of where you have a larger audience typically watching it, and it's much more passive. These poster presentations can be much more uh, discussion-based in a way. Typically, if your poster isn't crazy popular, you may have anywhere between one and seven people come by your poster at a given time uh, within the session that you have it up. So that really lends itself more to individual discussion and a lot more of a back and forth that really is not going to happen as easily with a lecture type format. Certainly you can lecture for your poster, but it's not really something that people are going to stare at PowerPoint slides for like you're doing right now. Instead, it's going to be looking back and forth between the speaker and the poster. There's a lot more of a social interpersonal engagement involved. For people that don't like that, maybe poster presentations are not for you, but for others that really need to have a social component for better memorability of the data and of the interaction and perhaps informing new connections that are advantageous for work or otherwise just potential good colleagues to have in the field that you can have fun with and kick back with in years to come. These are all important factors that should not be dismissed. So we get again, why I present a poster in particular rather than just you know lecturing about something with PowerPoint slides <laughs> as I am doing right now. Well, so there are some things that kind of go between both of these. So gaining public speaking experience kind of applies to both types of formats. And gaining experience with condensing, summarizing, to depicting scientific data, that too can apply for both formats, though I do argue that it is a little bit more of a particular thing for posters, and we'll see that in a bit. For the students at Occidental, this is particularly important. We have these senior comprehensive projects in which typically uh, they'll, if they're working in a, a STEM type uh, field or even the um, liberal arts generally, they, they 
are going to present posters, but something more like theater and arts department and things like that. They may have other types of projects that are part of the senior comps, things that might be more integrated between students as well. So this might apply more so for people that are of my similar disciplines, social sciences, et cetera, than it would for the more arts centric type departments. That said, I think it's worth knowing about how these poster presentations are configured. So for the Occidental students or students that have a similar type of requirement where for their senior year, they have to research a topic, uh, whether it's in the literature or actual hands-on research, and then they present it. This will help you format your poster. Maybe not your document per se, that's a whole nother beast in itself, but the poster for sure. This will help you share your work with peers. Again, you could argue that certainly doing a PowerPoint presentation might also do the same. But another thing about the PowerPoint presentation is that you need audiovisual equipment to set that up. And for the amount of people that want to present their data, there just isn't enough time, space, and audiovisual equipment to accommodate that, especially for the larger conferences that have thousands of attendees. With poster presentations, although the data can be relatively finalized by the time the conference rolls around, I feel like a lot of the poster presentations I see are data that is actually not quite done yet, which is fine because that's the point. You don't want it to be completely finished and published and then you do a poster on it. It's kind of a moot point. Uh, so you have work in progress and that tends to be what's more in poster format, whereas with uh, presentations via PowerPoint or similar program, they will be in a much more mature story, overarching kind of format where things are finished up and there are multiple threads, multiple experiments. Whereas in a poster, things might not be so comprehensive and them being in their infancy allows for feedback from other people working on similar things or even different things that are in your similar field. So this feedback can be very important for trying to guide what steps you take next as you're actively continuing and finishing your project. I've already mentioned networking opportunities. This does extend to potential employers. And when I mean that, I don't mean just in the sense of some uh, biotech company seeing your work, but additionally, and probably more likely at some of these conferences, people that are professor scholars, they may be looking for a researcher to work under them. That is essentially what a postdoctoral scholar or fellow will be, that they are after their doctorate, postdoctoral, meaning that they've completed their PhD. But typically, it's expected that people do a sort of internship, mentorship, apprenticeship uh, before they try to apply to be a full-fledged professor themselves. So they'll be doing primarily research, and it's research that is a little bit more independent and a little bit more hardcore than it would have been in graduate school. So this allows you to kind of pad out your research resume and diversify your skill set, ideally if the postdoc is a good fit. So for instance, I had obtained my postdoc by presenting my research at the SFN conference. And so I think if I did not present it there, I would not have had as good of a chance in getting to the lab that I did. Of course, we have to think about the fact that there's a work-life balance. And I'm not saying that begrudgingly, it's an important consideration. So when you have the ability to do so, the timing, the workload, the funding, it may be a good idea to go to these conferences because outside of the conference, when the conference itself winds down for the day, Seeing the sites in an area or being able to meet up with people in a new setting might be really important for having memorable and good breathing room around what is normally a uh, very work-centric kind of stuffy environment. For example, one of the conferences I presented at previously was in Zurich, Switzerland. And yes, this cost a pretty penny. I got the uh, school to pay for some of this, but as you might imagine, at least the flight costs alone were pretty steep. 
I still think it was worth it. Um, I was willing to to pay in for that. And I presented my poster and went to basically a place that was so unlike anywhere I had ever been to. So this was really important to me. Now, we have an idea of why we present posters. And additionally, the posters, they can be a little bit more of, quote, the dynamic poster format where you can have them be a little bit more animated, but they're still poster-like where they have a little bit more flexibility in looking around on them. Uh, and it's a bit different from, you know, typical PowerPoint where you go slide by slide by slide in a sequential manner. You can have things stitched together all at once in front of you like a whole scene in these dynamic posters. So that would be another argument uh, for having poster formats. Now, there are other considerations. The audience, of course. And the audience will determine a lot of things before you even begin presenting. So even before you make the poster, you should consider who is this poster for? Obviously, it's partly for you, but you should also consider the fact that the poster will be pitched to a specific group of people. So the question is, depending on what conference or what uh, convention day that you're going to be presenting at, are the people that are going to be coming by your poster mostly fellow undergraduates? Are they going to be graduate students? Or are they going to be mostly people that have a doctorate uh, and or are established beyond that. And so this makes a huge difference as far as the type of data you present and the depth of the data you present, as well as how you explain things that you are presenting. The comparison I like to make here is that we have a regional conference for, I, I think it's STEM type research, but they might have other things beyond just regular STEM stuff. Um, they definitely have social sciences as well, I don't know if they extend beyond that into like anything more historic or anthropological, um, uh, which is still scientific. So we have this comparison. It's called SCUR. I think that's for Southern California Conference on Undergraduate Research. And then we have SFN, that national one. So we have something that is much smaller, definitely meant to be a regional thing within one state, and it's pitched toward undergraduates, hence the U. SFN is for people at all levels of their career, but mostly on the later ends, and has a bunch of uh, vendors as well, vending scientific equipment there. And additionally, it's like very sort of high level professional stuff. So one example here would be a depiction of how things look at skirt. So we have a poster presentation uh, some of you have, that have a keen eye might notice a very familiar emblem here, and I believe over here in the corners of these respective posters. And that is because they are Oxy students presenting at SCIRT, uh, possibly ones that had done the summer research program. And so there are certain launching off points where if you do something within a school, it can prep you for being able to go to a conference outside of that school. And then you could even work your way up rather than jumping straight into the deep end as it might feel with something like a national conference. So the audience, if they're not of your specific discipline, this is something to carefully consider. In particular, if you're dealing with fellow undergraduates that are outside your field, you have to consider how you're going to explain things and how you're gonna depict things on your poster, whether you're gonna simplify the data immensely or not. So you have to have what's called an elevator pitch. You have to explain things in much more clear, jargon-free format. And this is not just considering that they're undergraduates peers, but also the fact that they may come from very different disciplines. You would not try to use biomedical uh, or biochemical terms, for the most part, around fellow undergraduates, especially if they're coming from psychology, sociology, or even if they're coming from the physics field, these might all be very foreign terms for them. These terms can get very niche. They can get very specialized for a given field. 
So being able to explain things in a coherent manner is very important to these more general audiences. And even if we're going outside the realm of undergraduates, let's say this is supposed to be presented to more of a general public audience, having that skill of breaking things down into understandable wording is extremely important. So I really suggest you lean on the idea of not uh, relying on particular terminology except when it's absolutely necessary in these types of situations. In contrast, if you're going to a specialized conference, you don't want to spend a bunch of time with the elementary stuff. So if I'm going to present something at SFN, where N is for neuroscience, I'm not going to explain how a neuron works to these people, because by and large, the vast majority of people showing up should know a lot more about how a neuron works. And in particular, there are probably a bunch of people that know more than what I do about how a neuron works, because that is their life's work how all the ion channel kinetics work on a physics and chemical level and things like that. So you have to consider that as much as you want to break down the language for a general audience, when you're dealing with a specialized audience, take the words that are like niche to your specific research project and break them down, but don't worry about breaking down everything because there's going to be some resource and time commitments in doing that. And at a certain point, a person's going to be like, okay, skip, skip the preamble. Let's get to the, the meat and potatoes of it, the, the real deep data stuff. Of course, for somebody attending SCUR, you might want to give a very brief background on how the brain works, how neurons work, and so on and so forth, if it's relevant to your research project. Another thing between these two audiences, the venue and amount of posters and time. So in the case of SCUR versus SFN, let's take a look at what it looks like. A typical poster room in SCUR might look something like this. This may give you anxiety looking at it, getting into a hopefully post-COVID age, or at least post-COVID isolation age. But this is the typical format of posters in the undergraduate conference setting. And so even though this aisle looks pretty cramped, we see that there are about mm, somewhere between six to eight posters, some maybe off screen from where we are here. And that's per each side of these poster boards. So we could estimate maybe it's like somewhere between 36 and 40 posters in this room at this given time. And they may have a changeover where there's an afternoon session and a morning session, and there are different sets of posters on each one. So, okay, it sounds like we got closer to like 80 to 100 posters coming out of this one room. And then there might be another day's worth of stuff or there might be multiple rooms. So that sounds like a lot of posters. Not everybody's gonna wanna go to every poster because they might have specific interests within a topic and not wanna see everything that there is. And that's fine. Now, is there, people will still be able to see all the posters they wanna see in the setting. Even as cramped as it might look or feel in this picture, there is not a constraint on time so much in these settings or other similarly small conferences that have an attendance between like 100 and 500 people. This is only one fraction of the poster board room in SFM. Uh, the Arrangement goes usually from A1, and then the numbers will either go from like 1 to 52. And it doesn't just go A to Z. It goes like A to triple M. So imagine how many posters that might be. That's one poster session. And that's usually a morning versus afternoon thing. So there's two poster sessions per day. And then there are about four days worth of posters, if I'm remembering correctly. So just multiplying that out, that seems like a staggering number of posters. And there certainly are, because there are so many disciplines within neuroscience. So considering that, and considering that this is a convention center, I believe this might be the DC one. If not, it's likely San Diego's, um, the same place that Comic-Con occurs in. The large exhibit hall is, it's very spread out very long and so it feels like you're running across an airport if you're trying to see a poster at a32 and want to see another poster at zz21 
it's going to take a lot of walking. And even though the posters are up for four hours, people are only expected to stand by their poster for one of those four hours. So there are extreme time constraints in how far and fast you can travel without breaking into a sprint like a crazy person in this setting. And so all this wraps up to saying that you want to be able to convey the main points of your poster to the onlookers because they are in a rush, chances are, if they're trying to see all the posters. Unless they seem like they're leisurely walking around a certain aisle that has a subtopic, chances are they're going from point one to point two and running all over the place, and they don't want to have to spend a lot of time looking at each poster if they want to get everything they want. Things are far more leisurely at the undergrad conferences and far less, I guess, urgent feeling. This isn't to scare you about these national conferences. As a poster presenter, you'll be kind of stuck in one place for an hour and more if you'd like to, or if there's audience interest, and that's all fine. Um, just that if you're trying to see multiple things, you might have to have a little bit of a, a triage mindset where there are certain things that you can't physically get to because you can't go that fast without running into people and without causing yourself problems and exhaustion. So all this is to say that as a presenter, you should consider the audience's needs as far as like what kind of time they can spend in front of your poster and how fast you can cut to the chase. That said, you should always be open for answering questions because if you go through your spiel about what the poster contains, then you want to be able to go into more detail as people need it. Don't front load all the detail at once. I suggest just going over the main points. And then if the data and the pictures are unclear to the audience, then you could open the floor for questions. You can let people ask questions in the middle of your presentation. And that's all well and good. And even though I make it sound like you should consider the needs of all of your audience, you can't please everyone. And that's another important thing to consider that you shouldn't try to please all the people that are there. Some people are just going to be disgruntled no matter what you do. So don't worry about that. Just worry about conveying your findings in a clear manner and in something that isn't too laborious and time consuming these larger conferences. Here, I think that these smaller conferences give a lot more freedom and those types of discussions that people can have, and they can feel a little bit less stifling with the amount of people around a poster. All that said, how do we get people to our poster? We shouldn't just expect people to show up right in front of our poster, whether it's in that large SFN setting or a smaller SCUR setting. We need to know what brings people to the actual poster. And so my recommendation is that you want to have a very clear and sufficiently detailed abstract that's submitted in advance. Typically, conferences will have a program they put out. And so you will be submit, submitting a summary of your research. And that summary should get people interested. So that's basically what an abstract is. It's the same summary that you would put in front of a academic research article. So it gives you an idea of, OK, brief sentence or two on the background, then a hypothesis or research question kind of posing what the unknown is that your experiment is focused on or your literature review is focused on. You give a brief overview of the method methods, like two to three sentences, lacking the painstaking details, of course, because that's what goes into the poster. You give a brief overview of the results, which can vary in length. Let's say it's like three to five sentences, depending. And then you have a concluding sentence or two to wrap things up. So that's a usually good cohesive summary to structure that is your abstract. And these are submitted to the conference programmers beforehand so that they can put it all into the program and then they can have the audience look online as to the scheduling and the summaries attached to certain posters and decide what they want to go to and other things that they saw a title and they're like, oh, cool. Then they read the summary and they're like, mm, I'll make it less priority. That isn't to say your research is not of interest, but you can, can't please everyone. So don't worry about trying to do that. Just try to present your data and be confident in it. All right, so all this talk about an abstract, you think that summary is a really good inclusion. 
and that should also be in the poster. Well, if there's already been an abstract submitted in advance, I don't see really a point to putting the abstract in your poster, especially if the abstract is allowed to be lengthier based on some conference rules. So there are some reasons to not include the abstract in your poster, as strange as that might seem. But one of the biggest ones is how much space you have on the poster to tell your story, your research story. And the thing about abstracts is that they can be different lengths for different conferences. So for some undergraduate conferences, they might say, oh, it has to be under a certain amount of words. You can't go over, otherwise they won't accept it. And that's fine because it keeps things short. Interestingly though, SFN, at least as of this video, their conference abstracts are still allowed to be very long. I think if I'm remembering correctly, um, it's some absurd amount of words. I, I don't remember the specific number, so I'm not gonna just throw it out there, but usually you're allowed to make them double the length of the average conference abstract. So people cram in a ton of detail. Now imagine putting a very, very, very long paragraph and slapping that onto your poster. People could read the abstract, but if they've already read the abstract, you've now wasted a chunk of poster space on that whole process. So that's one of the reasons why I recommend not actually including the abstract, because if people are coming to your poster, having already known what the topic was, and then wanting to see the details and the pictures and the proof, then you don't want to waste their time by having extra stuff on the poster that they don't really need any further. For people that aren't familiar with it, that's where your job comes in. The poster is supposed to be a summary of the research. So if people are interested and haven't read the abstract, you give them a quick rundown that would probably take about as long to explain as it would for them to read the abstract. All right, all that aside though, what else brings people to your poster? Well, certainly things that grab their attention. If somebody is just passing by because they're in a row of posters that are all on the same topic, so they know I'm kind of interested in potentially all these posters because this is within like kinesiology or something, and that's their field of interest, then they're going to probably at least glance at all the posters as they walk by. And so something that might cause a person to stick around would be clear, eye-catching pictures and visuals. This is how advertising works after all. There's a psychology behind it and certainly you want things to grab people's attention. And this is one of those unfortunate cases where perhaps the data alone may not be enough. Some of the ways that you present the data will keep people more interested unless they are crazy interested in the data beyond just the looks. But if we're talking about the vast majority of how people work, uh, that is gonna be based on eye-catching type of stuff. You don't have to make it like sparkles and bedazzle your poster like a crazy person. Just make it clear what's going on with very simple but stylized graphics of the process. I do have some examples of this. They're not gonna be like the biggest, best, brightest examples. I still think that they're great. Um, and that's not uh, putting down anything that other people have worked on in their respective posters. It's just one of these things where like, sure, you could stylize it a billion different ways and there are gonna be different uh, criticisms in how you do that. The important part isn't like getting bogged down in the details of exactly how it's represented, but instead looking at how we represent the data in a simple but yet eye-catching manner. So you got some people at your poster. What keeps them there? Well, I always say with posters, less text, more pics. And this does generalize into PowerPoint presentations as well. You've probably heard the very tired age old adage of less, sorry, of a picture says a thousand words or however you say it. But there are certain points at which you kind of need text to highlight certain ideas. However, you do not want blocks of text for people to read through. If people are on time constraints in particular, a picture can convey that idea or that information a lot quicker than having to read through blocks of text. Not to mention, if you are pressed for time at a conference trying to look at a bunch of posters, you will not have the motivation to read through paragraphs upon paragraphs if you have other places to be. 
Not to mention in general, you might not have the motivation to read through paragraphs or, and paragraphs of multiple posters. There just isn't the motivation to do all of that. So you wanna cut down on the amount of text. The text can compensate by being larger font to fill in the space, and that is totally fine and expected when it comes to posters. Again, you don't wanna skew all text. You wanna have some because text is important in conveying certain things in language where pictures cannot, especially when you have titles of certain panels of your results or uh, certain key points you wanna the audience to consider like this was our main research question or this was our research hypothesis you put in bold underline increase the font size to really convey okay this was the important part what did we do about that and then you like highlight certain other parts of your text that people should zero in on so as much as you want to add more and more information you want to kind of cut down the text and there are some tactics on how to make up for that lacking text that i'll talk about aside from just pictures Additionally, if somebody can't follow your poster as far as the flow of ideas, it's going to be really obnoxious and they're not going to want to stick around to try to figure it out. Uh, so if your ideas are all over the place, like you have an abstract on the left and then you put your introduction all the way on the right side and you put your results in the middle and then your conclusions in the bottom left and then some other things in the bottom right that are not quite related, people are going to get actually frustrated and maybe not even know completely why. And it has something to do with the fact that you're poster format isn't having the ideas filing sequentially visually on the actual poster. There are a few ways to do it. You can kind of do it like left to right, up to down, kind of like reading format. You could have it such that the intro and methods are on top of each other on the left side. The results take up the middle and upper right. And then the conclusions are tucked down in the bottom right corner. That's a typical format. It's fine. You could also do it in a sequential manner uh, where it's like intro, top left, methods, top middle, results, um, maybe like a little bit on the top right, bottom left, bottom middle, and then conclusions on the bottom right again. So being able to follow it along in a clear and understandable manner is important, as well as just the connection of multiple ideas that aren't disjointed text. Here we have an example, again, another Skura poster, in which you wanna have pictures that make it kind of clear what you're studying. So although people that are outside the molecular biology field might not know exactly what they're looking at, anytime you, you see these pictures that look like a bunch of weird squiggly ribbons uh, that are all twisted around each other, these pictures are typically protein structures. What are protein structures? Well, they are how proteins much like the stuff in protein powder, usually much more complex stuff like the stuff that makes up parts of cells. They actually don't just come in strands. They have to be formed into these weirdly shaped globs to have their specific functions. For instance, insulin receptors, the stuff that receives insulin so that we don't basically drown in blood sugar, this receptor has certain three-dimensional shapes. And if you change that three-dimensional shape, it won't work the same way. It might not work at all. So the three-dimensional shape of these things is important. And so I'm able to figure this out just from looking at these shapes of protein structures. Uh, the particulars of this poster, we could probably zoom in to figure out exactly what's going on. But generally, all I need to see is that, okay, these are pictures of protein structures. So she's gonna make an important point about how if you change these, it's gonna change the function. This isn't to say that you shouldn't have bar graphs. Bar graphs are fine. Sometimes all you can have are bar graphs or even just tables of numbers. That is all fine. And that's fine because that is still a summary of the data rather than having blocks of text. There are still blocks of text here. I probably would prefer to trim these down slightly more than what they are, but there's only so much you can really do with that. For instance, I probably would not have had a results component here. Again, this is not dismissing the student's work. This looks extremely comprehensive. But in, in my personal preference, I would have probably cut down on a results text and made just titles explaining what the main results are for each part of the figure. Conclusion text is fine. I would have probably turned it into more bullet point format. Introductory text, same sort of thing. If you could cut out any sort of unnecessary wording, 
definitely an important thing to consider. Another thing that keeps people at your poster. Sometimes it's not just the poster. Sometimes it's actually you. So you stand with your poster. And I say this literally and figuratively rather than the poster standing alone and explaining things by itself. So although I'll kind of discuss some ideas of this later and how what happens when people fail at doing this, for now, just consider that what I said before about how this is a form of information and conveyance that is connective with people. It socially connects to people on a face-to-face -face level. Even in a video format, there's still a lot more interpersonal interaction allowed than there is in the typical lecture format, a la this that you're watching here. So when you're trying to present, don't lecture like it's a bunch of PowerPoint slides. You can have a bit of a lecture as like a start off for people to understand, but you want to have engagement. And so we can see from this poster example that there is clearly some amount of banter between the student and the onlooker that even though there is a lot to see in this poster, they seem to be having a good time as far as explaining or talking about the data and ideas behind it. I mean, they could also be talking about something totally unrelated yet totally hilarious, but still it's engaging. And engaging experiences make for more memorable content. If somebody has an extremely dry and boring poster presentation, something like this, then it's going to be a problem as far as the audience remembering anything, especially if they're asleep, because you don't really remember things that are happening around you during sleep. So yeah, this guy, um, by presenting things in a boring format, even on a poster type situation, it is not going to help you with audience remembrance and having less engagement with the audience. It kind of shows a implicit disinterest in the interpersonal interaction. Now, I know people may struggle with interpersonal interactions. That is fine, is expected for some segments of the population as a whole. That is just normal. That said, I think that you might have to try to craft your interpersonal skills for presentation at the very least to get this poster format working more effectively for you. So that is to say, you don't just lecture through the full poster, you give the run through. And so rather than being like a monologuing NPC, giving a whole dialogue, well, no, sorry, monologue, giving a whole uh, lecture about things, expecting no audience feedback that they will just passively absorb things. You want to stop and ask questions after each bit that you go through, maybe not every single time, like every five seconds, but after you go through a chunk of your poster, you'll just kind of stop and say, do you have any questions about this? Okay, moving on. And then, you know, you go forward with it. So you make it much more interactive. You make sure that the person is following you every step of the way rather than passively absorbing. You affirm that they are assimilating the data. So what are the tools? Well, there are a few tools I recommend. By and large, a lot of people, even for making posters rather than PowerPoint slides, they will use Microsoft PowerPoint or Google Slides, or what I had used through a lot of grad school was open office presentation program. And so these are all good for just quick and easy formatting. You can configure the slide size to be full size poster. You can change the inch measurements or if you're not using English measurements, you can change it to metric in much larger sizes than what would print on a normal piece of paper. However, if you're trying to get more complex drawings in there and having a lot more creativity and configurability with your poster, PowerPoint may have some limitations. I know the Google Slides can have more limitations. OpenOffice generally has the same sort of abilities as PowerPoint, but are usually like a few years behind, which is fine for most people. Um, and I mentioned open office particularly because I mentioned it was, I was using it in grad school as it was free. So one of the considerations about the programs going to showcase today is that these programs being uh, either cost or free make an important impact on what your abilities are. So if you want to do more than what Google Slides does, but you can't 
pay for PowerPoint or otherwise don't want to. Uh, Open Office is definitely a good alternative to PowerPoint, Word, Excel, and other programs that are stand-ins for the Microsoft usual stuff that costs uh, for some people an arm and a leg, depending on what their salary and income are. All right, well, what if you want to draw? What if you want to like, make new figures that aren't just bar graphs? You can use these other programs for making the figures specifically. So there are Photoshop and GIMP. Yes, that is a very funny name. I think it stands for Graphical Image Manipulation Program. Don't quote me on that. But now you have an idea that it actually stands for something rather than being some very strange sounding word with strange connections to it. Now, Photoshop, um, that cost stuff is Adobe Photoshop. It also is, um, not exactly the most user-friendly thing. I find GIMP to actually be a lot easier to use. And even though I can pay for Photoshop, I would rather not use it. It, it changes often uh, when they update between years and things are harder to find or like configured differently. GIMP doesn't change too much and things tend to work the same way that they did before. And of course, GIMP being free, though you should support them with donations if they ask for it, in my opinion. GIMP is a much easier alternative that seems to do pretty much anything else I needed to do. Photoshop may be able to do a lot more complicated stuff, but that is not things I need to do uh, as somebody that represents my data. So this gives tons of flexibility with drawing. Now, if you're doing drawings, though, it can be time consuming because as time consuming as things are in MS Paint, they can be similarly consuming in time with GIMP because you're drawing pixel by pixel. So this is um, sort of a pixel or point-based system for drawing. So that's basically what you're probably used to if you haven't used something like Adobe Illustrator, which I'll mention in a second. And generally people don't draw their entire poster in Photoshop. That tends to be more time consuming than doing it in something like PowerPoint. Because in order to separate all the elements, you have to put them in as probably separate layers. The thing that slides do, and the thing that Photoshop does more so, is that uh, slides will kind of have things as separate objects. And so you can kind of isolate them and manipulate them accordingly. With Photoshop and GIMP, things have to be explicitly separated into different layers that have like a transparent part of them, a see-through part, and then other parts that are not see-through. You can move the layers around, but it's a little bit less configurable even though you have a lot more drawing options. And then Adobe Illustrator. I don't know of an equally uh, effective stand-in for this that is free or lower cost. So I've opted in to just pay for Illustrator for my stuff. And the reason why I prefer it uh, it allows for much more flexibility with drawing and modifying shapes as all independent objects. So similar to how things work in PowerPoint where you can separate out blocks of text, you can draw shapes that you can modify later, and you're not having to like redraw them at any point. Illustrator goes a little bit further in that it allows you a lot more flexibility with, with what you can do with those shapes. And you can even mess around with the exact curvature of lines or import other drawings and convert them into fully modifiable objects. Each path is considered a separate element that could be deleted or modified in some way. You could basically convert a circle or a simple shape into any shape that you want in Illustrator. There may be reasons to do that. Um, there may not be, but one of the reasons why I picked Illustrator in particular is that the Rat Brain Atlas the uh, individual diagram pages, the figures, can be exported out as Illustrator files where you can then isolate parts of brain areas, delete other superfluous parts of the diagrams, and then just sort of draw on it to highlight areas of interest. So there's a lot of flexibility and some pre-made formats. Additionally, a lot of other programs like Excel, um, SPSS, possibly graph pad, other sort of statistical format type applications that export bar graphs or other graphs 
they can export them in a way that Illustrator can open up and modify anything on. So if you want to change the scale on the y-axis in a low hassle way, if you want to change how wide everything is, the individual color of certain elements on it in ways that the program was too like clunky to allow you to do, Illustrator can do that. And that's something I've done a lot in Illustrator. And you can make your entire poster in Illustrator, as a lot of my colleagues have done. But there is a steep learning curve. Uh, it is costly in some cases. And it may not be that helpful compared to doing it sometimes in PowerPoint if that's a simple and easy way for you to jump into it. So first format, doing it as sort of slide presentation, but making a single slide is usually the preferable one. So let's take a brief detour from this. So I have some video links here on screen. Uh, I might put them in the description so that people can click on them. But again, they are elsewhere on this channel. They show you how GIMP and Illustrator are used for configuring figures. And you can make full posters with those configurations. So I won't really showcase them here, especially since they are a little bit resource intensive while I'm trying to record something. So instead, let's take a moment to look at just a PowerPoint poster. Here, a student had put together this poster. And so I helped her revise some things here, but this is her, her brainchild of sorts. And I especially like the uh, way that she fully tackled the illustration of the ideas behind the introduction here. So some things you'll notice, this is a single slide in a PowerPoint format. And this here is uh, the format that posters usually take, at least in the STEM fields. If we zoom in on this, we will see some interesting things. So let me just um, pan around a little bit. Up here, we see introduction. We see methods below it. We see results. And then elsewhere below the results is conclusion. So there's a flow to the information in the poster. Typically, what people do in these posters is they put the college or organization emblem, or if there's multiple, emblems, putting both of those or multiple of those up in the top corners of the poster. The title should be big and bold and contrast with the background. The author block, as it's called, should feature all the relevant authors that were involved in the research, the same people that would presumably go on a publication if it were to be put out. And sometimes affiliations are important, especially if people are coming from different labs and different schools. So that's what these superscript numbers correspond to, that one person is from psychology department, another person is from cognitive science, another person is from biology, and so on and so forth. Something that I think should be more of a standard practice that people do not do as often is sticking the contact email where it can be easily found in bold font or large font. The contact email here is not something that people have gotten used to putting in posters, but I think it's really helpful where somebody could just either write it down or snap a quick photo of the title block here, get the email, and then to look at it later and make the contact about it. OK. There may be some otherwise uh, unoccupied space in one of the upper corners. You could choose to put some other emblem up there. Another thing I've usually done is putting the poster session, poster location, and everything so people know that they found the exact number of what they're looking for. That may or may not be necessary. It's up to you how you want to like configure that upper part. But if we zoom out again, we'll see how much that actually occupies the poster. In this case, it's occupying still a sliver of this poster that's a little bit taller than it is wide. And that's fine, because a lot of the poster is supposed to depict the actual stuff going on. Let's take a look at the introduction. In this case, the introduction features some discussion about the topic at hand, chronic administration of ethanol and the brain a role for delta plus B. So the introduction talks a little bit about substance use disorder, so drugs of addiction, and how they change the chemistry and the protein structures of the brain. One such protein is delta plus B. So we have a little bit of a background here. People will have different opinions on whether to include citations in the references. I find that unless those citations are extremely important for the audience to take down, in their notes, 
as they go from poster to poster. That usually I don't include citations. I, I very rarely have included them in my own posters, but I don't begrudge people doing that for theirs if these references are extremely poor, important for grounding what the prior research is on. Generally, though, in my experience at conferences, people don't usually ask about the prior studies leading up to this, because that ends up being a much more in-depth question than what needs to be asked at a conference in poster sessions. So you can kind of save yourself a little bit of space by accessing the citations and a references section later on. That said, if you really want to include it, don't feel bad about it. So we have some introductory points. They're in bullet point format, giving you an idea of a flow of ideas that are separable in a way. So we know substance use disorder, bad, changes brain. Delta Phos B, one of the things that is changed in the brain, causes changes in behavior. When we mess with Delta Phos B explicitly, we can cause drug-seeking behavior. And drugs of abuse definitely cause changes in this protein. And that probably leads to drug-seeking behavior. And then we kind of wrap up with yet there is a limited, there are a limited number of studies that use alcohol to in get, investigate delta phosphate induction, meaning what is the connection between alcohol causing this protein to spike up, which presumably causes a spiking of addiction-like behaviors? So we have the big research question bolded, underlined, increased font here. Does chronic ethanol exposure, so drinking, does it also increase this protein? in the prefrontal cortex, part of the frontal lobe, and the nucleus cumbens, part of the classic reward pathway. Let's take a closer look at this picture over here. These are all individual elements that the student included. So she had to find these respective elements here. And so we have various drugs that are addictive. And this includes stuff that's not necessarily illegal. Uh, so we have things like cigarettes, nicotine, uh, tequila being alcohol. And then we have prescription painkillers and we also have just old school morphine. So all these are things that are saying, okay, addictive stuff. And then time being exposed to addictive stuff, causing changes in the rodent brain. And here we have a little arrow. Each of these elements, by the way, is put in individually. So none of these things are really connected. They're just overlapping on top of each other. For instance, even this little drawn arrow here, that's inserted in there, this green arrow inserted, this text box inserted. And then we have this brain diagram that highlights the nucleus accumbens in blue here. This is a uh, coronal section of the mouse brain, I believe, that's highlighting that. And so all this is saying, okay, well, this is changing this protein in this brain region, or potentially it is. So then what that does is it changes gene expression which means that it changes eventually behaviors, increased susceptibility to substance use disorder, or basically more addiction prone. All right, so we got a pretty clear cut way that this poster is set up. Now, as far as methods, people can represent this in a variety of ways. And this unfortunately ends up being a little bit more text heavy given how technical it can be. I do have some alternatives I can show in a moment to express how this works. So I'll show those in a second, but this is also not really problematic because people that want to know the methods, you'll either describe it to them simply, or if they want, they can read all the details and have some detail that they have questions on, maybe explained right within here. So this gets complicated. We're not going to talk about it here because that's beyond what we care about. But it's broken into several parts being like the treatments and the subjects, the stuff that was done to the brain tissue, and the way cells were counted on the brain tissue, and how they were labeled in particular in diagram form here. And then we have pictures of what's going on in the results over here. So we have these diagrams of the rat brain. In this case, we have sort of zoom-ins of what is happening with certain brain areas. So rather than showing us the whole slice of the brain, called brain sections, by the way, these boxes are indicating, OK, the pictures you're about to see, they are zoomed in on just these areas here. So we have the ventrolateral and ventromedial quadrants of the prefrontal cortex. 
So we have zoom ins here and we have some uh, interesting fluorescent photos. Now if we're zooming in really far on those, you might be wondering, what am I looking at? This list looks like a bunch of gobbledygook of green. Well, the important part is that with a lot of fluorescent labeling, we are looking for labeled cells. And there are a lot of labeled cells here. Each of these bright green dots, notice how they're about the same size, some of them being similar brightness. These are all individual cell nuclei that are showing increases of that delta fos B protein, or at least large amounts of it. So in these areas of the brain, there are a lot of cells that have this protein, and it's in quantifiable amounts. And the same thing applies for other photos as well. You might be wondering why isn't the why aren't these dots popping out a lot from the background? I'll actually talk about that in a bit. These pictures are intentionally brightened more than normally would be shown on screen. So we have examples from these groups. We have examples from the nucleus accumbens and other brain region. We have them organized for different subparts. We have them organized by control versus treatment groups. So alcohol drinking versus non-alcohol drinking. And then things are then quantified, showing on the y-axis in clear, bold font what the important metric is. On the x-axis, the clear and important relative groups. And additionally, split up by sex, so male versus female rats, and how they differed in their um, results, as shown in the tissue. Some people do include these figure captions. Um, that can vary as far as how long you want to make them. Including the stats, it, people can have different opinions on them. Some people might feel that, oh, including the stats might be a bit superfluous um, unless people ask. Other people might want to see the stats just to know exactly like what the values are, what the effect size is. All those are important considerations. So that is sometimes something you should ask your mentor about when it comes to poster creation. But these go into a little bit more detail that otherwise, if a person who's presenting the poster is talking to another attendee, one of the other audience members that's kind of waiting for explanation on things could then kind of sidle up, get a little closer and read some of the finer print here to figure out what's going on in these figures. And we have just a very short bullet point conclusion part here. So this demonstrates how we don't need to have an exhaustive conclusion. We just have it summed up in a short amount of text. It's good practice and also good etiquette to include acknowledgments. So grant support, any other sorts of support, things like that. And that summarizes the typical format. And again, this is an undergraduate poster. Uh, it should be noted that this poster won an award at the respective student research date. So kudos to her for good poster. There is another poster I will show you in a second. Let me just pull it up. I think this is the one I want. So what I'm going to show you is a poster that was presented at the SFN conference. The previous one was uh, at an undergraduate um, conference day on the CSU DH campus, as you could probably figure from the content included in there. This one um, will have a sort of similar format. And uh, you'll kind of see some slight differences. Some things maybe even I could have improved on some other things that uh, I did differently in mine. So um, in my case, I probably could have done better off with a lot more bullet point breakdown in some parts of my text. But you'll also notice that I eliminated text wherever possible. So let's take a look. Alrighty, so this is something that was created in Adobe Illustrator. 
And right now I have it open in just Acrobat Reader, but uh, this can also be open in Illustrator. Something to keep in mind is that a lot of things that get exported into PDF can usually be opened in Illustrator and have a lot of modifiable parts still to them. So when you save stuff in Illustrator, you can save it as PDF so that other people can view it that don't have Illustrator, but then you can go back and edit it still, usually when it's in PDF format. So similar kind of setup where we have the author block, the title, the uh, school involved, the affiliations. And additionally, this is the poster session number and the poster location at the conference I was at. We zoom in and we see an introduction. It's a little bit text heavy. I suppose I could have broken it down into a little bit more bullet point format. I chose to include another picture that basically depicted the idea that, okay, we have this crucial brain region. It's involved with creating disgust when we turn it off. When we turn it off though, we don't really know what's happening elsewhere in the brain. So one of the things we could look at is another protein called CFOS or FOS. This is cranked up usually in neurons that have a lot of activity. And so we could stain to label and highlight where FOS is elsewhere in the brain to figure out, okay, when we turn off the VP, what else is turning on to create the disgust behavior? We have a method segment, a little bit of necessary text, but then a lot of other stuff that is showing the diagrams of how things were done. So injections being made into the brain, other things using this other technique called DREAD, very scary or silly sounding name for a very lengthy acronym. We scientists like our silly acronyms. We have a test set up for showing how animals can react directly to taste. So this is how we determine pleasure versus disgust. And additionally, we have an experimental timeline showing what happens. Now, I know I have pictures of babies here. This is just to show how there are similarities between rodents and humans. This isn't to say that we were testing on infants. I was not doing that. We do not do that at the old lab. So uh, this is just kind of representing, oh, we have pleasure face of rat. This looks similar to pleasure face of human infant. We have disgust rejection response in a rat. We have disgust rejection response in human. This is to demonstrate that these aspects, even though we look at rats and we don't think that's a human, we don't think they're similar to people, there are behaviors that are similar across many species. Reactions to taste as far as pleasure, disgust, and even neutral responses are very much conserved across species. And this is one of the reasons why we tested it in rodents rather than people especially because we could manipulate the chemistry of the brain in the process to change how things were converted to a disgust type of perception. So yeah, we have a lot more picture stuff going on here. That depends on whether you can actually convert your stuff into more picture format. For the other poster, a lot of it was very technical and chemical, and I don't think that it could have been all represented with pictures alone. So there is a need for text sometimes in the methods segment that may vary depending on the project. We have results based on the behavioral stuff for this project, big title kind of demonstrating that. You'll notice I kind of uh, eschewed any sort of figure caption. Uh, another stuff that's showing blocks of panels here of brain regions of control vehicle versus drug treatment. Now they have some differences that are subtle, some differences that are notable, and where we have cells that are being lit up by the activity that they had. All these little bright dots that you see in the green background. We have this quantified down here for the respective brain regions. We have some other stuff relating to the dread experiment. And then in my conclusions, I chose to do a little bit more of a picture conclusion format, highlighting the brain areas that we did see lighting up from these events and an acknowledgments down here, and my contact email, of course. So it might be better, as you saw in the previous poster, to actually put the contact email up here in the author block where people can just find it and contact you right away. All right, so that's that poster. And like I said, the other programs like Illustrator and GIMP, I do have separate videos on.
we won't worry about that here. We saw some of the layout of the poster so far as well. So typically organized left to right and or top to bottom, it makes sense. Here's another thing that most people don't consider when they jump into trying to make a poster. How are you mindful of maximum physical poster size? Well, firstly, the conference organizer should give you information about how big the poster boards are in either feet, centimeters, meters, inches, whatever sort of metrics. You need a length and a height measurement because if you don't have that, you could make a poster that is too small, meaning that everything on your poster is shrunken down and the text and the figures are hard to read or see. Alternatively, you could make a poster that's massive and flows off the edges of your poster board, making it hard to pin, but worse yet, you could be intruding and overlapping on somebody else's poster in the neighboring poster boards. And that's kind of a problem and it's gonna piss off some people. So you wanna avoid doing that. Additionally, if you have more space to spread things out, make the font big. Make it as big as you need to. So knowing what the maximum expected dimensions of the poster are, will dictate how big your font ends up being. Because you'll at least start out with certain font, you'll start out with pictures, and then you'll stretch them to fill in the poster. You may not want to just stretch them out right. Doing that in PowerPoint seems to make them lower resolution. So I do suggest against uh, doing that. But the, the text can easily be stretched out to be better without having like the resolution issue. And the thing I was going to mention before, uh, now coming up, the reason why some of these pictures have a lot of uh, this green background is because when you print it, the background ends up being muted a lot more. The printing process or the way that ink is applied to these posters tends to make the pictures much darker than they appear typically on screen like what you viewed now. So do plan to amp up the brightness of your photos intentionally, and you can do this easily in PowerPoint. You'll just have to do it with every photo that you put on there. Not necessarily to do with bar graphs, not necessarily to do with um, photos that have a lot of light color, but if it's a fluorescent microscope picture, typically those need to be amped up, especially if they are blue or red, because the human eye uh, does not see those colors quite as brightly as it does green and gray and yellow. Now, before I get to this, I actually should, bearing the lead on that a little bit, I actually should talk a little bit about the other uh, aspect of this. So we have this poster again, I'm just gonna pull it open. One of the things I didn't mention is that we look at the top and the left sides and we see that there are actually measurement scales here. So it starts at zero in the middle and either direction we go out by inches. How do we configure a PowerPoint slide to be a different size than what a default set? Well, it may differ based on the program if you're not using Microsoft PowerPoint, but there should be a setting in all of these types of programs. You go to design or something similar. You go to slide size, and instead of picking some sort of standard like this, you go to custom slide size. And here you can configure the real world length and height or width and height of the respective poster. Generally, you want this to be in uh, metrics that uh, the poster can be printed out on, so inches or, again, centimeters or something like that. But this is how you create a poster of a specific size. So you could start off by creating a poster of a given size, putting your stuff in there, and then stretching it to fit. Again, I don't recommend doing that with the pictures necessarily. It can lower the resolution if you don't stretch them equally length and height. In other words, if you take a picture like this and you try to stretch it lengthwise of it, this can really screw up the resolution lengthwise. You wanna maintain the aspect ratio. In other words, you wanna maintain the proportion of length by height. So if you are trying to modify this, you want to usually pinch it by the corners and you wanna expand it equally. This does not allow you to expand it equally here. So to do that in something like PowerPoint, you could do a right click or for Mac users, I believe this would be like command click. You could do size and position and you can hit lock aspect ratio. And then 
when I try to modify this here, it only allows it to go uh, in this diagonal expansion. It doesn't allow me to stretch and skew it on the edges unless I specifically grab the left uh, edge, right edge, top edge, bottom edge. If I do it by corner, it will actually maintain that aspect ratio, the proportion of length and height. So it doesn't look weirdly smeared or stretched or anything like that. All right, then. Uh, so this is how you can configure it to be a different size in PowerPoint. And there are similar ways to do that, certainly in GIMP and certainly in Photoshop and Illustrator. Now, going beyond the format of the poster, getting back to you and how you present your poster. The data does not speak for itself. You should guide the audience through your data. Otherwise, it'll be like this story. Now, note this is sort of secondhand story. I was not present for this, but I had a lot of colleagues that had been present for this. When I was in grad school, there was a seminar that at least early on in grad school, a lot of us dreaded because we had to present on a topic that was either our own research or something that we had done a literature review on. Twice a year, we did this. Everybody had to do it once per semester. The presentations were expected to be around a half hour and then question time was added on top of that. And usually there were a bunch of professors present in addition to all the grad students in this class. So typically there were two, maybe three, maybe four professors present given whatever day it was for these presentations. So they were a pretty um, intense seminar. I think that it really prepped us all for presenting these types of PowerPoint lecture type things for conferences. So I would say that that class prepared me very well for that. And I am thankful for that. Admittedly though, at the first year, I was horrified to have to do it just like everybody else was. But it's one of those necessary uh, things for growing, as long as, of course, the professors are all supportive, which I felt they were. However, what they're not supportive of is somebody that's clearly not doing the work. That may not be great in circumstances where they clearly didn't know that they weren't doing the work though, which is what the story revolves around. So now that you have the background of what this class was like, there were some students there that were not part of our graduate programs. We, there were two that were taking that class. Um, there instead were some students that were through extension studders, some undergraduates taking it for credit. And generally everybody attending the class was expected to present if they weren't one of the professors that were dropping in or presiding over the class. And so, yeah, there is this one person, uh, somebody that was part of the extension center. And my colleagues were basically acting out the story as it happened. Uh, this person was explaining some sort of paper that she had read. And so she had gone into depth about the background to what her knowledge um, entailed. And, you know, our, we had different levels of knowledge kind of all over the class where if we're starting out, we might not know a lot about the subject and we'll feel bad that we didn't know enough when we got some of the tough questions. And so this would prompt us into next time making sure that we knew a lot more background when we jumped into it. So this person wasn't really aware of the, uh, the harsh environment, I guess, of the, the poster presence, the, the PowerPoint presentations or, or how harsh it can feel or the expectations. Again, I shouldn't make it sound like the class was unnecessarily harsh, but it had some high expectations. And not meeting those, you can kind of feel like you did not go to do, do a very good job. So um, the way that it worked was that this person presented on the topic, and then it came to the results. So she explained the introduction for, well, from what I understand from my colleagues. Uh, she gets to the results. She copy pasted some graphics from the article of interest, which is fine because that was allowed. We're supposed to be depicting what happens in the research rather than trying to create new research out of a paper necessarily. So she's depicting the graphics from the article and then she stops and says, let's just let the data speak for itself. And from what I understand, the professors were either quizzical or aghast to that statement because that is exactly what you're not supposed to do ever 
when you're presenting complicated scientific data and or bar graphs. So that didn't go over well. Um, and so they that, that led to a very, um, very intense questioning. By, by the professors. Professors like asking a lot of tough questions of students. And so they, they definitely did that for that one student. And um, it, it's not to say that she was automatically a bad presenter, but that was like a very memorable mistake that people were like, oh, that people cannot do that when they present, that that should not be done. So again, I don't wanna make it sound like this person was inept in presenting, but they made a clear mistake on what was expected, what they were supposed to include, and that is kind of the consequence of it. And that is something to be realistic about with these presentations and poster format as well, that if you are presenting on something, but you don't know the background on it or the ideas behind the data, and you have somebody who's really interested in that, or otherwise somebody that typically asks tough questions without thinking much of it, you can feel very pressured, anxiety-filled, guilty for not knowing certain things and so this leads into another aspect where it's like what what is the limit on what you're responsible for knowing as an undergraduate you shouldn't be held responsible for knowing everything and anything related to your topic of interest i think that's a bit of a tall order it's, it's too much i think that's really malicious almost to expect to do the undergraduates you can be a really well-seasoned undergraduate and know a lot about your, your topic of interest. And that's fine. Not everybody is. And so I don't think that everybody who's an undergraduate should be held to a super high standard as far as knowing the full depth of everything in the field. Given if it's a senior comprehensive project, you should know a lot about it. You should be able to at least give good guesses on what the answers might be. You should be able to apply your knowledge in some way. And that's really what a lot of professors are looking for. They may not be looking for whether you know the exact answer, unless it is your specific research. But if it's something related or related to the related thing, so two degrees removed, it might be expected that you know something about how things connect, but you don't know the details because you haven't read about it or the research might ex not exist. Or you don't know if the research does or does not exist because you haven't looked at that angle of it before. There's a lot out there and you can't know everything, especially starting out as an undergraduate. That said, you should try to know what you can that's related to your topic of interest in preparing for these poster presentations. And so we know already that saying, let the data speak for itself. The data doesn't, it doesn't do that. Uh, you have to speak for your data that you're presenting. Even if it's not stuff that you research, if it's something that you did a literature uh, dive on, then you should be able to reasonably expand upon that in a sort of dialogue type format in these situations. So you speak for the data. You help orient the audience through the data. If it were just as simple as slapping a poster up there and then leaving, that's not much different from doing a pre-recorded thing like I'm doing right now. And then just walking away. The whole point of the poster is to be interactive. And so you want to be interactive with the audience. You want to make sure that they are engaged. You want to make sure that they are following you every step of the way and that you are checking to make sure that they are doing so. So again, going back, not faulting the student who was the lit, the data speak for itself person, but it's also one of these things where I think it's important for everybody to hear this sort of idea going into it, that there are expectations and that there are certain standards to be met. And it's very likely that that student just didn't know and just uh, had attended thinking, oh yeah, I'll just do this and it'll be fine. And then that did not go over well. Uh, so again, not saying that that poster presenter was bad necessarily. I think that she just honestly didn't know that that was not the standard that she should have been meeting. So it's important that you know that. And that's part of the reason why I made the big deal about SCUR and ha having certain expectations of the level of the data and how you explain things. And something like SFN or another national or international conference where the expectations are put much higher. 
and why it might be good as an undergraduate to go with the small conferences first and then work your way up rather than diving into deep end and then having panic attacks or something like that. Not saying that's gonna happen to you if you have a good support network with your lab, your colleagues, your mentor, you should be fine. But it can be a very intense experience for people, especially given the amount of people around and how that can be a trigger to some people's anxieties. Speaking from personal experience to some degree. So yes, that's sort of my take on how you go about etiquette wise presenting your poster. Let's look at a few more details though. When the audience goes to your poster, you may want to give them a little bit of time to figure out what's going on. Some people like putting the pieces together themselves. Other people want to actually have you do a little bit of the work for them. So you'll get different types of people going to your poster. Regardless, give them some time to decide what they want to do. So when somebody comes up to your poster, they start looking at it. You maybe wait 10 to 15 seconds. You don't ask them immediately. You don't wait too long, but give them like 10 to 15, maybe 20 seconds of looking over your poster. And then if it seems like they're just kind of fixating on one part, you kind of look at their eyes and they're fixating on one part of the poster. You can just sort of politely ask them, hey, do you want me to give a walkthrough of this? And if they say, sure, then you take them up on that. Uh, you have maybe a pre-rehearsed spiel that you go through as far as giving the brief background instruction, maybe less than what the text says. You give a point-by-point -point play of the methods, again, maybe less detailed than what the text says, and then you jump in going picture by picture. Now, if somebody says, no, I don't want to walk through, usually that doesn't happen. <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing that that does happen, but it, it might. Uh, usually it doesn't, but if somebody doesn't want to walk through, you say, okay, you just back off and let them do their thing. As far as guiding the poster uh, audience piece by piece, one of the important things is that if you have complicated graphs, if a picture seems to have a lot going on in it, you explain them part by part rather than just letting it sit there. This is kind of why I took umbrage with the idea of data speaking for itself, that that's really not good presentation etiquette. When you have a figure sitting up there, let's say it's even a bar graph, but it's a complicated one. You explain the X and Y axes. You explain the metrics on those axes. You explain the different groups that represent each of the bars. If it's a correlation plot, you explain that briefly. If it's some other type of graphical format of the data, you explain that as well. If it is even a picture of a brain region, I just explained to you what we were looking at, those little bright green dots being like, oh, those are cells. And the more cells there are in a region, that means that this region has changed more than in the other group. So in other words, if the control group had fewer green dots than the treatment group, then something the treatment did increased the amount of that protein showing up in the stain, the amount of cells that showed that protein. So giving a really deconstructed viewpoint of the graphics is part of the verbal aspects of the presentation now the speech usually when people are nervous they will talk fast we do not want to be like sonic we do not need to go fast if anything understanding does not come from doing everything fast despite what some famous debate tacticians may make you think going fast does not allow for proper digestion of ideas and appropriate questioning of those ideas so you want to monitor the speed of your speech. You want to remember to take pauses. Even if that is between chunks on your poster, take at least a few moments, maybe even just kind of count down in your brain, taking like five, 10 seconds between chunks of the poster to just stop and breathe while the audience digests. If you tend to talk fast, just keep that in mind, take pauses, Make sure you're breathing, because otherwise you're going to start hyperventilating just to make sure you can stay the next part. And it's going to make you faint, feel faint and dizzy, which will make your anxiety worse, which might make you pass out, or it might make you feel unwell or something like that. So these are things to consider as far as just making sure that you keep your own self calm 
based on how you're presenting your stuff. So no, Sonic, we cannot be all as fast as you. Now, kind of related to some of the points I've mentioned before, when you don't know all the answers, you want to give a reasonable conjecture. You want to use the knowledge that you do have to try to connect the dots to answer the questions that you are being presented with. And this can also apply directly with your own research where it was something that is, it was like a blind spot. You didn't know that that was an angle that you could look at your own research with. And you may feel bad because you're like, well, that seems like it should have been part of my project or my design. And you didn't consider it at the time. Try to sidestep the feelings of guilt with that and try to tackle the question first and then see what prevented you from having that perspective that this questioner has. Maybe the discussion will help you be aware of certain things that are your blind spots with the experiments. Rather than seeing the questioner as some sort of threatening imposition, try to see it as somebody that sees things from a different perspective and can unlock your mind into seeing those things in a similar way so that you don't have those blind spots anymore. Constructive rather than critical. Obviously, with any sort of public speech type talk, you want to practice and practice, especially in front of people that are going to be very similar to your potential audience. I've already mentioned that professors can be an intimidating audience members. Some professors in particular just like asking tough questions and making students feel anxious. Not an etiquette I agree with. It is something that is pervasive in academia in general, probably pervasive in various other work cultures as well. Regardless, you should stand up for your research as it is your thing. Even if it's partly somebody else's project, if you worked on it, if you know the details, and if you are certain about certain details, you should stand by that. So somebody might ask, well, why didn't you do it this way? This way is so much better. You may not have all the answers to those sorts of questions, but you might actually be able to affirm, hey, we did it this way because we thought this idea was reasonable. You might get pushback. You might say, look, I, I don't have that perspective, I was pretty sure when I started this project that this was the way to do it and this was my thinking. So I doubt you're going to end up with something that combative sounding in a poster presentation, but regardless, you should not feel guilty for standing by your data in a certain way. So you only know what you know and you can't know everything. You just did things based on what you knew. And there's always room to adjust course or to change things to be more accurate and correct within reason, of course. So don't back down if you get intimidating questions. Stand up for your research and answer with confidence whatever your knowledge base allows for. And when you absolutely don't know something and you've exhausted what your conjecture can tell, you have to be comfortable with admitting where your limitations are. You don't want to just make stuff up and trying to pretend like you are an expert on the subject. That is not the way to go. We already have enough of people doing that well outside the academic field. So we don't want pseudo experts. We don't want people that are level headed. They know what their limitations are, but they're willing to make a stake in the parts that they have experience with. And additionally, since it is your thing, we go back to the idea of don't be guilty about things that you overlooked try to look at critiques as ways to make your research blossom out in ways that you didn't consider before. Try to see these criticisms as constructive, even if they're coming from somebody who's a stodgy old professor type that is curmudgeon and otherwise just doesn't make you feel super comfortable with their line of question. All right, this scenario might happen to you. What if your data is not ready in time for a professional conference? Some conferences give a lot of lead up time. For instance, SFN, uh, it was very unusual for their abstract submission deadline to be in the middle of July this year, 2021. And typically the abstract deadlines are somewhere around like May and the conference didn't really change its timeline. The conference is still happening in November, like it usually does. So some conferences that are massive, they need a lot of time to put together the program and schedule and figure out where everybody's going to be, when they're going to be there. That's really tricky when you're dealing with thousands of different presentations. So if your data happens to not be ready, 
Uh, this might be more of a problem if you have a conference that takes the abstracts in a month or two before the actual conference happens. So that's where the timeline's a lot tighter, where you have some data, it's not quite complete. You can make some conjectures about where the data is right now, but for the poster to actually be complete, you need to have it further than where it is at the time you submitted your abstract. What if it doesn't work out? What if things just completely go flatline? What if COVID hits, no one can go into lab? This probably happened to a lot of people. So how do you navigate the situation where you're like, my poster's just not ready. This is not gonna come together in time. Unless specific funding requires it, like a grant says you must present at this conference or something like that. Unless there's a specific situation requiring that or a program requiring you to present in order to stay a member or whatever. If it's not that scenario, you're usually not forced to present. At the very least, certainly not physically. So there's good etiquette and bad etiquette for trying to back out of a poster pre presentation or even some of the um, slide presentations. You, of course, want to let the conference organizers know, if you can, and if possible, as far in advance as you can, that you can't present. And then have them or somebody else plan to include a small note, if it's a poster board situation, have them include a small note about maybe what happened, or you don't even have to go that far to saying this poster presenter will not be presenting today. Uh, and then you provide contact info, your contact email for the people that were coming by the poster. They read the abstract, they were interested, and they're like, oh, where's the poster? So then people can at least contact you if they're still interested in talking with you about the research. Because they might have actually wanted to know about the research, but the poster alone would not have given them enough info. And they may have wanted to actually talk to you about related things that were on top of the poster, like potential opportunities to work together, to come together and research. Then there's bad etiquette. You say nothing to anyone. You leave no note and you ghost whatever your potential audience is. That does not leave a good impression. They may not remember you specifically doing that, but they're gonna walk away being like, okay, this person didn't show up. They didn't leave a note. This is kind of rude. That's the way it's generally looked on in these types of conferences. So you wanna at least give some sort of opportunity for people to know, okay, things didn't work out, so this person's not gonna be here, but you can talk to them through this line of communication being your email. You can even have maybe a friend or something put that up in your poster board place for the time it's supposed to be up. However, it's typically best to present some data, even if the project is unfinished or even if the data is unfinished. Conference organizers may have certain limitations on how complete they want the data, and certain data may be very incomplete at certain conferences. I think that the biggest hurdle is the audience not being comfortable with exactly how the data look. Uh, if the data is substantially incomplete, then the audience might be like, this project isn't really far enough along for us to make any claims here, so you shouldn't be presenting it. That would be the pushback that you would get. It may not be from the organizers, but instead the audience. That said, especially for undergraduate presentations, you might want to demonstrate your work and what you've learned. In particular, because undergraduate uh, tenure is about learning things and learning skills, you want to demonstrate that even if the project didn't work out as showing any significant data or the project didn't actually create data because something kept going wrong physically with the actual work, you want to show what you've been up to what you've done, what steps you've taken to try to make everything work. And so that's where you want to present some of those findings. And although it's somewhat unlikely, in my opinion, by trying to go through all these routes, you may find out something new or somebody that you present to may have a solution to all the problems you've been tackling for months on end up until that point. So these are important opportunities, if anything, to present some data, not just for public speaking experience, not just to pad out your resume and CV, but also to allow yourself opportunity to get solutions to problems that you've been having, perhaps even problems that you didn't even know that you were having. All right, so conclusions. This is basically wrapping up what I've talked about so far. So you want to consider your audience before you even begin to craft the poster itself, consider what their background knowledge is, 
consider what the size of the conference is, and thus consider what the time commitments may be of the audience members. Consider your tools. PowerPoint may be your go-to, but for more creativity and a lot more control, Photoshop and Illustrator and their related equivalents out there, they may be better options, uh, depending on your flexibility, affordability, and the learning curve you're willing to put up with. Posters should reduce words, not in size, but in amount. So if anything, they should reduce the amount of text, but increase the font size and bold key terms. They should amplify the pics, both in size and eye-catchingness. There should be a clear flow of ideas. And basically, you want to be able to attract and retain the visitors to your poster. The presenter should speak, especially to replace the wording that would have been on the poster. So instead of having paragraphs in the poster, the paragraphs are coming from your mouth. And that is supposed to be done in a way that is dynamic with the audience. So there should be a conversational nature to it, that there are openings where the audience members can be like, I. Could you go over that again? Could you say something about that? And that's where they get it edgewise. And then, of course, you want the monologue that you're giving to be evenly paced, that people can follow you with your words, that they're not struggling to follow you, and that you're not giving yourself anxiety by making your voice go faster and faster and faster until you pass out. I've certainly seen some students do this. I've seen some students in their presentation uh, kind of forcefully give me the run through every time that they gave it to every other person previously doing exactly the same, making sure they have things exactly the same, sweating bullets in their um, high professional outfit, suit and tie situation. And just don't do that to yourself. It might be important to dress appropriately and dress professionally, but don't amp up your anxieties. Try your best to maintain a level head. Not easy, I know but try to consider it, especially when you're practicing. Try to give like brief little call outs or maybe set yourself some way of reminding yourself mid um, presentation to think, have I stopped to breathe? Have I stopped to pause? Have I stopped so that people can ask questions so I can breathe? <laughs> so those are important things to consider. Having some sort of reminder on your person to do that might be a good tactic to consider. Sometimes problems will happen. Like your poster doesn't print out that day and it's conference day, that would suck. That may happen. You could try to figure out a creative solution. You could go in front of your poster spot and just pull out your laptop and just start showing people on the screen and then send the PDFs out to the audience. So there are options. There's always a way to work around things. And even if things don't work out quite as planned, or if you feel like somebody really grilled you, you did not live up to their expectations, and they, you think that they uh, think that you're an idiot, keep in mind that all these circumstances are not disasters. So basically, if your poster does not burst into flames, or you are not setting fire to your poster, if it's not that, if it's anything less than that, as far as negative stuff, it's still going to be a learning experience. And even though you might feel bad in the moment, just take a step back afterward when you have time to decompress from your poster presentation. Just consider that even if there were negative parts that you just go back and think, okay, these are just areas of improvement. It does not mean I am a failure. It means that I have to consider other things, but it does not say anything about your value as a person. And that's probably one of the most important things about dissociating your research from you, that you always have value as a human being and that your poster does not speak for you. All right, so usually um, what I've done previously is uh, if I'm presenting this to an audience live, I'll have them bring something to the post, to the, sorry, this lecture, this sort of seminar workshop thing. Uh, like whatever research they've gotten done so far, maybe just bullet point ideas or one graphic to show. And if it's a large group of people, like 40, 20, 50, just random large numbers of people, in a Zoom kind of format, online format, you can put people into three-person breakout rooms where they give a quick rundown of what they've been working on so far, 
They certainly don't have a complete poster because why else might you be watching this? But they have an idea of what they want to present on. They have an idea of what the main components are, and they may be helped by peer feedback. And so doing these breakout rooms for like 15 to 20 minutes is generally something I find advisable so that they can get feedback from people they're comfortable with and potentially people that are outside their discipline as well. So they can know when they've gone too far with the technical terms and when they have to start explaining things it's like, oh, wait, people don't know what that is. Even though I spent months of research on it, it's only been me working on that. So I have to tell these people what I'm talking about. So these interpersonal interactions, they're another form of practice, I feel, uh, going into it, where you have bits and pieces of the poster that are underway. You don't have a, even the file for a poster, but you have like things that you're going to plug into the poster digitally. These are things to present to other people to bounce ideas off of. They may give you a solutions or considerations that you did not have in mind previously. Okay. So that wraps up this general presentation on poster presentations. As always, if you have questions, you can leave me comments. Additionally, though, um, I mentioned before that the other videos I have on the channel explain how to navigate and use both GIMP as well as Illustrator. Um, I think I have another one in there about creating graphs in Excel that are bar graphs and correlation plots. So that may or may not be helpful, depending on what you do. But hopefully this whole talk has been informative. So take care and I'll see you in the next one.